Just before our daughter Angela turned five years of age, her kidneys suddenly stopped. It was a very scary time. Actually, it was several days before they correctly diagnosed her, and then they put her in an ambulance and rushed her across the state to the University of Michigan Mott Children's Hospital. Later, they told us that if she had not arrived when she did, she probably would have died. But as it was, for two or three weeks, we weren't sure whether our little girl was going to live or die. Or if she did live, if she'd have to be on kidney dialysis the rest of her life, or perhaps get in line hoping for a kidney transplant. When at last her kidneys restarted, obviously we were ecstatic and full of praise to God. Now, Angela is full grown now. She has her own family, and she is totally healthy, no after effects. We're so grateful. Yesterday, I sat down and wrote a poem about all of that. Now, uh, I'm no poet. This is not a, a work of literary art. Uh, trust me, this is no literary masterpiece. But here's why I wrote it. I wrote it because the book of Psalms in the Bible is all a book of ancient Jewish poems. And I wanted to illustrate how poems work so we'll understand how they can be interpreted. I'll make that more clear as we go. But first, here's my poem. Monster death knocked at Angela's door. For a child just five, it was a scary roar. Her kidneys failed. That's super bad. Our family and friends were terribly sad. With darkness now threatening our dear daughter's breath, she peered o'er the chasm of approaching cold death. Our world crashed around us. All was lost, it was clear. Where is God, we might imagine? He sure doesn't feel near. The doctors hoped and did what they should, but to say it would work, nobody could. Night and day, Gloria stayed by the hospital bed. She held Angela's hand, tried to help keep her fed. They read from the Psalms, stopped at number 56. They chose the third verse out of all of the picks. When I'm full of fear, David wrote, David prayed, I will trust in you and will not be afraid. That became Angela's verse. She said it all the time. To bolster her faith, it became her line. Then at last God healed her and made her well. With praise to God, our hearts did swell. God's power now eradicates the monster named death as he heals every child with a word of his breath. Every sickness is banished, all forever now past. His perfect kingdom forever will last. Now, please overlook the not very good poem. And let me point out three things about my poem that are like our text, the poem that we call Psalm 46. First, my poem was written in response to a very real and important historical event, our daughter's illness and recovery. Psalm 46 was written as a response to a very real and important historical event. It was God's deliverance of the nation Israel from the terrifying Assyrian army. Neither my poem nor Psalm 49 would mean nearly as much without an understanding of the historical event behind them. Second, like most poetry, my poem used some figurative language. It was intended to be vivid and sometimes hyperbolic or an exaggeration over the edge, monster death knocking at the door, scaring her with a roar, <laughs> peering over the chasm of death. That's poetry. And in Psalm 46, we see the same thing, poetic language with figures of speech and hyperbole and exaggeration. You see, a, a, a real, literal monster named death didn't knock at Angela's door. That's how poetry works. And, and third, my poem about God's healing of Angela, my poem goes way beyond that event and if you noticed in the last stanza, asserted that God heals every child's sickness and banishes all illness from the earth. Is that really true? 
Does every sick child today experience God's healing? Are all illnesses banished from the earth now? If God banishes all illness, why in the world are we in the midst of this horrific pandemic, which is taking the life of nearly two Americans every minute? No, obviously God does not heal all children and all diseases, at least not now. My poem really looked forward to the time when God's kingdom comes on earth and illness and disease, tears and suffering will all be banished forever. In the same way, Psalm 46 does that. And we'll see that it looks past the invasion of the Assyrians and God's deliverance to the great deliverance in the future in the kingdom of God. You see, the Psalms, like poetry, sometimes merge uh, the past, the present, and the future as if they're all one. And Psalm 46 certainly does that. It merges them all together. Now let me just quickly review those three things about my poem and how it compares to Psalm 46. Number one, they're both based on a historical event. Number two, they both use poetic devices like figurative language and vivid hyperbole. And three, they both, both merge the past and future together to paint a picture of what Jesus' future kingdom on earth is going to be like. Now with that in mind, let's look more closely at Psalm 46, this ancient Jewish poem written, the inscription says, by the sons of Korah. They were a family of professional musicians who ministered at the Jewish temple. And this psalm was written to be used by the temple music director. He was kind of like a music pastor in our churches today. He was to use Psalm 46 in the worship at the temple in Jerusalem. Now let me call your attention to the, the structure of this poem in Psalm 46. Too often we read the Bible, we miss the fact that the Bible is a literary masterpiece. If we don't see those literary devices, we'll not have nearly the respect and appreciation or sometimes the right interpretation of what the scripture is saying. Psalm 46, if you have your Bible, perhaps your translation uh, divides it into a number of different groups. There are three verses, then a space, three verses, then a space, one verse in a space, three verses in a space, one verse in a space, and what that is, is three stanzas. They were probably sung by the temple choir. And then there are two choruses who are, that are in response to the verses. And those perhaps were sung by all of the people who came to the temple to worship. Let me read the psalm for you, but kind of identify the stanzas. The first stanza is in verses 1 to 3, and it reminds us that God helps his people in all of their troubles. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their suffering. Then there's the second stanza. And in the second stanza, we see that God protects Jerusalem, his holy city, from destruction. The psalm says, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, Jerusalem, the holy place, the temple, where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. Then following those two stanzas is one chorus. It's just one verse, and it, it gives us the theme of the whole psalm. Verse 7, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And then the third stanza. The third stanza invites us to see that God will establish his future kingdom of peace throughout the whole earth. Verse 8, come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he's brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And then the second chorus, identical to the first. And again, it's a response to everything that went before and gives us a theme of the psalm. 
The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Well, the first stanza in verses 1 and 2 reminds us that God helps his people in all of their troubles. God is our refuge in every storm. He is our strength for every weakness. And he is our help in every trouble. Therefore, verse 2 says, we will not fear. He's our refuge, our strength, our help. Therefore, we will not fear. Gloria and I were just newlyweds in the last year of college. We were living off campus in a little apartment not far from some of our friends. The bills were beginning to pile up. We had to buy food. We had to pay the rent. We had school, and I couldn't find a job. It was a very scary time for two kids in their first months of marriage. We had a little box, it was about this big, that we set on our little table. And in the verse were a whole bunch of little slips of paper, cardboard slips of paper, each had a Bible verse on them. So every morning at breakfast, we'd pull the first verse out of the, out of the box and read it and then stick it in the back. See, every day we take the first one. And this particular day, frankly, it's the only verse I remember from all of the time we used that box. It was Psalm 46, 1. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Oh, my. That was so meaningful to us at that moment of our lives when things seemed so bad, we had no way to solve the problem. I needed a job. Don't be afraid. God is our refuge. He's our strength. He's our help. He's a refuge in every storm. The author uses very vivid, poetic language. Uh, it involves a momentous natural disaster, or an earthquake, or earthquakes, and tsunamis, which alter the topography with massive changes. <laughs> he writes, Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, isn't this vivid and graphic and memorable? Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Now, many Bible scholars believe that the historical background of Psalm 46 was God's supernatural deliverance of the nation of Israel from the armies of Assyria, led by King Sennacherib. The story is found in our Bibles. If you want to look at it later, it's in 2 Kings chapters 18 and 19. Now, the literal storm Israel was facing had nothing to do with earthquakes or tsunamis or natural disasters, mountains being moved. The real historic event pictured by that storm was the invasion of the Assyrian armies. It poetically pictured the destructive power of an earthquake and a tsunami that was how they felt about the Assyrian armies. You see, Assyria was in the process of conquering Near East at that time. Nation after nation had already fallen to the brutal brutality uh, of its armies. And the nations that had already been defeated had been put to death or enslaved. Their temples were sacked, the false gods that they worshipped, the idols were torn down and burned. And now they surrounded Israel, and they mocked Israel's God, and they said, we're going to defeat you, we're going to destroy you, and your God won't help you any more than all those other gods help them. Israel's godly king, King Hezekiah, received a letter from the generals of the Assyrian army. And in that letter, it demanded their unconditional surrender. And even if they surrendered, their city was going to be sacked, the people would be enslaved and carried off to Assyria to be slaves, prisoners of war. 2 Kings 19 says that Hezekiah took the letter and he took it to the temple and he spread it out before the Lord. And he prayed, Look how the Assyrian armies are ridiculing you, you who are the one and true, true and living God. Now, Lord our God, deliver us so that all the kingdoms of the earth will knew, know that you alone are God. That very night, 
the angel of the Lord moved through the Assyrian camp and put to death 185,000 Assyrian soldiers, decimated Sennacherib's army. One Bible translation has a rather unique way of describing the scene. It says, when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. I always chuckle when I read that. It sounds like when they all got up, they saw that they were dead. (laughs) That very night, the angel of the Lord delivered them. And scholars believe that that was a historical event that inspired Psalm 46. God, not military strategy, not superior military numbers, not superior military weaponry. God was their refuge. God was their fortress. He was their shelter in the time of storm. By the way, did you know that Psalm 46 was Martin Luther's favorite psalm? It was in April of 1521 that Luther, a Catholic priest who had discovered in the Bible, Book of Romans, that the transforming truth that God justifies those who believe in Jesus by their faith, not works. It was life-changing. Justification by faith in Jesus, not by works. But when Luther wrote about that, he was summoned by the leaders of the church to stand trial in Worms, spelled Worms, Worms, Germany. He would stand before the emperor and all of the prelates of the church to answer for his heresy. They found him guilty, guilty of heresy, which was punishable by burning at the stake. But they said, we're going to let you go into your room and you can think about this all night and tomorrow you can give us your decision. Luther went back to his room to decide whether he would be willing to recant of all that he had written, to deny the truth, the liberating truth that he had discovered in the Bible. There in the room, Luther opened his German Bible, and it fell open to Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. The next morning, Luther stood in front of his judges, inspired by Psalm 46, and he made the statement that launched the Protestant Reformation and changed the world. This is what he said. Unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of the popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against my conscience is neither right or safe. God help me. Amen. Later, inspired again by Psalm 46, Martin Luther wrote his now famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Remember, the word fortress is used twice in Psalm 46 in those two verses that represent the chorus and the theme. The Lord Almighty, literally the Lord of armies, the Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The themes of Psalm 46 appear all through that great old hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Let me just read a few lines, pick up the themes from Psalm 46. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing, our helper he amidst the flood of mortal ills prevailing. Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. Well, friend, let me ask you, what storm, what storms are you facing right now? What weakness are you feeling? How is it that you feel all alone and having no strength? What kind of trouble are you dealing with today? Psalm 46 is a wonderful reminder that God is our refuge and strength. He is our refuge in the storm. He is our strength in weakness, and he is our help in every trouble. Therefore, I need not fear. No matter what the storm is, 
no matter how weak I feel, no matter what kind of trouble I'm in, because the Lord, the Lord Almighty, the Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Oh, let me pause just a moment before I finish. The God of Jacob is our fortress. I don't think it's any accident that the psalmist chose to call him the God of Jacob. Now, it's surprising, especially when you know who Jacob was. This Old Testament character whose very name meant swindler, crook, cheater, deceiver. He was a habitual, shameless scoundrel. He was even, will, will, even willing to lie and to cheat his own family, his father, his brother, and later his father-in-law. I mean, he was a horrible person. The God of Jacob is our fortress? Why would God identify himself with, what a horrible, with such a horrible man, a selfish scoundrel? Why not refer to him as the God of Abraham <laughs> or, or, or the God of Moses or the God of David? Or he could have even said the God of Israel. That was the name God gave to Jacob after he had changed, after he wrestled with God. And he stopped depending on his own schemes. He stopped leaving God out of his life, and he started trusting God to help him. And he got a new name, the God of Israel. But God didn't say the God of Israel is our fortress. He said the God of Jacob. You know why I think he did that? Because lots of times we have the tendency to think, oh, sure, God's the, the, the refuge and the strength and the helper for other people, people who deserve it, people who live a, a really good life. But I mess up all the time. I, I'm, I'm a sinner. Sometimes I think I'm even like Jacob. How could God be my refuge, my strength, <laughs> my help, my pre present with me? I think that's why he chose this title, so that we would know that God's willingness to be our refuge, our strength, and our help is not dependent on what we do, not dependent on us being good enough or worthy or deserving or earning his help to us. No, it's all by God's grace that he is those things to us. Now, I love it that Psalm 46, in order to give us hope, moves past the deliverance from Sennacherib and the Assyrian armies, and it reminds us of the future day when God will put an end to all storms, all weakness, all troubles, all of the things in this broken world that, that give us a bad time, God's going to fix this broken world when Jesus comes and establishes his perfect kingdom of righteousness, peace, justice, prosperity, and health on the earth. Verses 9 and 10 point us to that day when God will put an end to all of that. Here's what it says. God makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. By the way, all of Psalm 46, except one verse, is about God. It's describing him. He does. He does that. He is. But in verse 10, it's the only place where it's not about God, but rather it is from God. God speaks, and God says, be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. You see, in the historical background, remember that Assyria had surrounded the city of Jerusalem, threatening to destroy the city, the temple, and kill or enslave all of the people. King Hezekiah got that threatening letter from Sennacherib, and he spread it out before God to basically say, we're helpless. God, if we're going to get out of this, it has to be you. You have to deliver us so that everybody will know that you are God. Then 2 Kings 19 says that the prophet Isaiah sent a message to King Hezekiah. It's about 15 verses. They're beautiful. But let me summarize Isaiah's message with just five words. God said, don't worry, I've got this. <laughs> that night, the angel of the Lord killed those 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. Sennacherib and what was left of his decimated army 
left like a dog with its tail between his legs. And a few days later, later Sennacherib was assassinated in the temple of his God by his own sons. Don't worry, God said, I've got this. Or in the closing words of the psalm, be still, I've got this. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Perhaps that's God's word to you, to me, today, about your storm, uh, about your weakness, about your trouble. God says, be still. I've got this. Remember, I'm God. You will face storms. You will feel weak and alone sometimes. You will experience trouble. But remember, I am the God who is going to fix everything when Jesus comes back. And right now, be still. Don't be afraid. I am your refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Father in heaven, thank you for this beautiful poem that you put into your word to encourage us. Help my friends who have listened to come to know you today as the one in the midst of their storms, their weakness, and their trouble, who is their refuge, their help, and their strength. For Jesus' sake, amen.